Today, I want to kind of uh, turn the theme of what we've been talking about, uh, but I want us to talk specifically about that spirit-led means sons of God. Spirit-led means daughters of God. In other words, when, when we're talking about I am a child of God, uh, I am that child of God, I think we, didn't we, no, we sang I am a friend of God, but, but the whole idea is, is that I am a child of God, okay? Uh, the truth of that is, is that if we are that, it must be, mean that we are led by the Spirit. It, those things come together. And uh, so today, I want us to talk specifically about this topic. And so let's just take a look at the, the verse that, verses that I'm using, which is Romans 8, 13 through 17, that says this, For that if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, what? You will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons or daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. Isn't that amazing? I, I, he, he contrasts the idea of slavery uh, to fall back into fear but now you have received the spirit of, you would think, maybe freedom from slavery, but he says adoption as sons, whom, I mean, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Huh. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So the whole theme right now turns to this whole idea that Christians are children of God. Everybody say that with me. Christians are children of God. Say it one more time. Christians are children of God. Now, no, nowhere else in the book of Romans have we got to up to this point have we been called children of God or sons of God? But now, all of a sudden, these words begin to ring out in, in the book of Romans in chapter 8, and they become words that are full of freedom, f full of joy, full of hope, because it's no longer just me as an individual. You know, I, I, I asked this question right after I became a Christian for a little while, it was so hard. I didn't understand that the Spirit was ruling and reigning in me and that I could just yield to Him and fall, and the Spirit would lead me. I kept saying, man, this is so hard to do good, you know. It's so hard to be what I need to be in the Word of God. And, um, and Brother Bob taught a, 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 I mean a Bible study called The Touch of the Spirit. And it was the, the whole idea that once we were saved, the Holy Spirit took up resident in us and that we could be led by the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. Woo! That took pressure off of me. Did it you when you learned that? That God himself, through the Spirit of God, lives in me and will lead me if I just say yes to him. Amen? So Paul is telling Christians about themselves who we are, who God is in relation to, to who we are, and that implies that it's going to impact our experiences, how we live our lives. In other words, being led by the Spirit is going to impact how you look at your circumstances, how you respond to those circumstances, how you respond to people, the thoughts that you have, the actions that you take. All of those things will be impacted. So I want us to learn the truth about the Holy Spirit and us as adopted sons and daughters of God. Now first, I want to go back just a little bit and review something I've already taught a little bit related to Romans 8, and that's this idea that I'm being led by the Spirit. Now, I want us to keep in mind that the Spirit is a person. It's, it's not an it. 
nor is it, well, I'll, we'll talk some more about that in a minute. Listen, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. The four here means that he is giving us an explanation of the verse right prior to that. So this is in verse 14. For or because all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So it makes us look back at 13. And 13 says, For if you, were, uh, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So, now get this. I've already taught this. Killing sin, putting de to death the deeds of the body, killing sin in our lives by the Spirit is explained by led by the Spirit in 14. Now, what's said in 13 is explained in 14, okay? So, killing sin in our lives is explained by being led of the Spirit, by the Spirit. And the whole, the, what also follows by that, it says that you will live, in verse 13, is explained by you are the sons of God. Come on. Anybody getting this? You should under, circle, if you will, in verse um, 13, the idea of putting to death the, the deeds of the, of the body and then point it down to verse 14 that says, led by the Spirit. You see the connection there? And then you will live in verse 13, you will live in verse 13, put a connection that you are the sons of God. Ponder that. Think about that. It's, it's giving us the because in verse 14 of what's being said in verse 13. Now, I don't know if you think through the verses this deep when you read them or not. But we should ponder some of these things. See, doing something by the Spirit means being led to do it by the Spirit. The Spirit of God is a He. He is not some kind of instrument in my hand. We are instruments in the Holy Spirit's hand. Can I say it like that? We're not leading Him. He is leading us. This may be revolutionary to many, but I'm just saying. <laughs> he is leading us. Hmm. See, he's not some kind of uh, a, a, a person I can just dial up uh, 911 occasionally and say, hey, Holy Spirit, get me out of this. I mean, that's not the idea. The idea is, is that he leads me step by step, thought by thought. Come on, somebody. Isn't that, the, isn't that what he wants to do in our lives? Can you say amen to that? See, we are being moved and led by Him. So to be led by the Spirit in verse 14 in view of, of its relation to verse 13 is to be moved by the Spirit to kill sin in our life by trusting, by trusting in the superior work of God Almighty because I am a child of God. So the evidence that we're the children of God is that the Holy Spirit confirms His presence by leading us into killing the, the, the deeds of the flesh, killing sin in our lives. And we shall, we should, as far as I'm concerned, uh, be sons of God because that proves, it's evidence that that's happening. And because now, if we're sons of God, we share the traits of the Father. Okay, I had a dad, and I share some of his traits. And wouldn't it make sense if I am a son of the living God, if I'm a daughter of the living God, wouldn't it make all the sense of the world to you that you would share some of the traits of the Father? When we're not talking about the human DNA, we're talking about the spiritual DNA. 
And if I am a child of the living God, let me tell you, there should be the fruit of the living God Spirit falling off of me. It should be there. It should be hanging from me. <laughs> Come on. I, I All of a sudden, I'm a new creation. That means, what does new creation mean? I have new taste buds. I have a taste for something different. What does it mean? It means I have new preferences. I don't want to go get drunk at the bars anymore. I want to go to the worship center and feel the power and the presence of the living God. I want to gather together with other believers. I want to be encouraged. I want to be strengthened by the Word of the living God. I, want, I have a whole new set of preferences. And I have a whole new set of pleasures. What I used to get pleasure from, I no longer get it from that. I get my pleasure from worship. I get my pleasure from reading the live, Word of the living God. I get my pleasure from obeying Him. I get my absolute sense of pleasure knowing that I'm in the very palm of the of the living God and I'm right where He wants me to be and I get great pleasure from that. I get great pleasure from going and scraping and begging and asking people to give money that I can then go get on a plane, fly for 35 straight hours across halfway across the world, get off a plane, get in a car that I don't even know the driver and we go out for four to five, six hours away. We set up a little of a, a bit of a camp we get on a basketball court in a, in a country I don't know much about and we set up and we worship and people start coming and all of a sudden the basketball court is completely filled with people. I get up through an interpreter and I preach the Word of the living God and we call for people to be saved and so many come down you have to stand up on a chair to start leading them in the center prayer that they might be saved. I get my pleasure from serving Him. I go back to a room that's not air-conditioned. Mosquitoes are going everywhere. And it's so uncomfortable. Sweat pours from my body. And we get up early the next morning and travel 50 hours to the next place. Do it all again. For two weeks straight. That's what it's about. And there is no greater satisfaction. There is no greater pleasure. There is no greater sense of accomplishment. There's no greater thing that you can grasp than feeling as though the, the God Almighty is using you. I have new values, new, new preferences, new tastes, new pleasures. And so it evidences my sonship. I, I, I'm going to tell you, I don't have to convince you that I am a child of God. I ask you to just look at my fruit. Just look at the fruit that God has been bringing about in my life and I can tell you, based on my fruit, what I am. The question, the real question is, do we fight with sin in our lives? Do we even care that sin is in our life? Or do we feel indifferent about sin in our lives? Meaning that it seems as though in today's society we have gotten to a point that sin doesn't matter much. Very few people wrestle with it. Very few people get upset about it. Very few people are, are disturbed in the Spirit when obvious known sin from the Word of God is present in their life. It's like we're calloused or we're indifferent or we, we, we just don't think it matters to God. Even though the Word of God tells us that God is angry with sin every day. We just continue the same old thing. See, being led by the Spirit means that we're at war with the deeds of the flesh. Let me tell you, the deeds of the flesh will lead to death. But walking with the Spirit will lead to what? 
life. Are you with me? Okay, so my promise of life is found in our being sons of God. See, the Bible clearly says, and, and I'll get to that in a second, but first there's the idea of killing sin by the Spirit, which explained by uh, being led by the Spirit. But the second idea that we want to address is uh, you will live, which is in verse 13, and you are sons of God, which is in 14. So it's explained that you're going to live because you're sons of God. It's being explained there. So... Um, this is what shows us that the promise of life is rooted in our being sons of God. What an incredible declaration that happens. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God Almighty declares, you're my child. Whoo! Come on. Somebody get happy about it. It's happy time in church. You can be happy. It's okay. He declares... Come on. He declares, you're my child. And you know that you have this eternal life because you're putting to death the deeds of the body of the Spirit. And being led by the Spirit shows that you are a child of God. So the whole point is, and this is important, it, and if children, now get this, so if I am a child of God, then I'm an heir, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Can you get that, your head wrapped around this? Whew. This is almost staggering to read. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Who measures up to be fellow heirs with Christ? Provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Christ. The question comes is, heirs of what? And here is the answer. Everlasting life and all the glory that contains it contains. Whoa. Man, let me tell you. No matter whether I live today or I die today, <laughs> where my plane lands is going to be in a glorious place. Everlasting life with who? Christ. The day that I am in heaven with Him, can you say, Hallelujah? I can't, my, the mind cannot comprehend, the soul can't even think through what one day, one moment, one hour, one million years, 100 billion years, what, whatever it may be in your mind, that we cannot comprehend how glorious that's going to be to be with Him. So, how does the Spirit of God relate to our sonship. And the whole reason that the leading of the Spirit proves that we're children of God is that the Spirit is through this idea of the Spirit of adoption. And this is the Spirit given to us to confirm a legal transaction that has taken place. See, when I come to Christ and I, I say, God, well, first, when Christ, when, when I'm wooed by the Holy Spirit to Him, and I see Him as He is, meaning my Savior, I respond, I invite Christ into my life. Guess what? There's a legal transaction that takes place. What is it? Adoption. All of us that have received Christ become adopted heirs with Him. Whew. And the Spirit is given to confirm that transaction. So the Holy Spirit now comes and resides in me. Therefore, the leading by the Spirit is, is evidence that all of that transaction has taken place. Can you say amen to that? Whew! The reality of adoption is this massive, firm, legal reality. And it's deep and it's strong and it's fully heartfelt and it's emotionally attached. It's real. I am adopted by God Almighty. That makes me a son of 
God. Come on, man, that is awesome. So the spirit of adoption is the spirit confirms and makes real to you this great legal transaction called adoption. That's how I know. Listen, how do I know I've been adopted? How do I know I'm a son of God? The Holy Spirit lives in me, is speaking to me, is leading me, is guiding me, and He's telling me, you need to be putting to death the deeds of the flesh. There are There's sin in your life that you need to be asking for forgiveness for and cleansing from who you are. Come on, people. We have to... Listen, when we're a new creation... <laughs> We have, we have new preferences, new desires. And if the old desires still continue to live around, around us or, or anywhere close to us, it's time to say, I'm going to sever those. And let me tell you, it's not I that can sever it, but the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in me, if I'll just say yes, can put it away. Sin does not have to rule in our mortal bodies anymore. You can say, that's the beauty of becoming a Christian. I can say no to sin. The question is, will you? You have the power and the authority to overcome any sin that's in your life. See, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior and your Lord and, and then treasure Him, you're going to treasure that you've been adopted. The Bible says in John 1.12, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become what? Children of God. Wow. To seal this whole thing and to affirm it and to make it experiential to you, real to you, God sends His Holy Spirit to live in you. The Bible says, so that we might receive adoption to this Son, because, and because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And he does this by replacing the fear of a slave toward a master. Now get this, God doesn't come into you and then say, now I'm the master and you're the slave. Fear me. (laughs) Does God do that to you? No, he doesn't do that at all. But he comes with the love toward a son. He comes with the love toward a daughter as a father. I love that. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to change the idea of being subservient to a master in in some kind of way that's going to beat you every time so you have the fear of beatings and and, and punishment and all that kind of stuff uh, toward this God that you can be confident, you can be happy, you can be peaceful, you can have the affection of a father toward you and the affection of you toward a father that loves you. That's the motivation. It's very different. So it brings me to this question, how does he lead? For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. Well, the Spirit doesn't lead by stirring up that fear. He leads by stirring up a family, a father, a son, a daughter, you see, by affection. He doesn't get you to kill sin out of some kind of a, you're a slave and you must obey me, but by making you a son who acts out of faith and affection toward God. That's, you love God so much, you want to get rid of of sin in your life. Are you with me? Anybody? That's the way it is. So, okay, now this is it. Write it down. The Spirit leads by 
bringing God the Father's love to us. In other words, He makes God's love to you so amazingly real. It becomes a present reality in who we are. We experience, there's an experiential love of God that comes and it, it resides in us and all of a sudden we go, wow, God the Father loves me. When the whole world hates me, when the whole world makes fun of me, when I can't even hardly find a friend anywhere, my God loves me. It's not just an idea. It's not some type of a future promise. We're talking about the now. We're talking about the present. We're talking about right when you accept Christ, the love of God floods the soul. It's something that happens in Christians. And this is the spirit of adoption making real to us the love of my Father. But the second thing is, is that it, it all, the Spirit leads by awakening our childlike affections for God. You know, as your children are going up, they reach that certain age, and I, I want to say it's somewhere between 5 and 12, somewhere in there. Man, they just... They just love you so much. And I, it's not that they, that ever goes away. They just have funny ways of showing it when they get older. You know, I mean, it's just weird, isn't it? It's just really weird and strange. But anyway, um, and uh, I've got perfect, uh, I've got a great sample size, if you ever want to know. I, I, I can tell you about this. But my point is, is that the, the whole idea is, is it awakens in us this affection to God. Uh, and that's what we should realize is our strength. The more that we, we apply our passion and our love to God, the stronger we become in the power of walking in the Spirit to say no to sin. Come on. Have you expressed this week your great love for God? Have, you, have those words even rolled off your tongue this week? See, the witness of the Holy Spirit that you're a child of God is the creation in you of affection for God. Has it been seen this week? You know what our guilty verdict is? We're so stinking busy. That's a technical doctrinal term that I use. We're so stinking busy. We don't have time to express our great affection for God We leave it to a Sunday morning or, you know, we leave it to whenever we do something good for somebody somewhere. Listen, we don't express it on a daily basis, my intense affection for my God because He has shed abroad in me the love of a father to a son. And in return, I should share my affection back to Him. Almost like a... A, a, a childlike affection. And the testimony of the Holy Spirit is the cry, Abba, Father. And the whole, the idea of the word cry and the, and the Arabic word Abba is because both of them point to a deep, deep, you know how the Bible says it should spring up uh, uh, from the very core of who we are living water. It's that idea. Spring up a well. Where is it coming from? It's the very soul deep down into who you are springs up. Oh God, spring up in us an affection of love toward you who has shed abroad a love in us. Spring up, oh love, within my soul. I don't know what happened to my false other voice, but it just left. See? Spring up. The Arabic word Abba and the word cry is the idea that we, go, we dig so deep down that we're at the very root, the core of a, of, a, of a well that's springing up 
and it just springs up with passion. It springs up with affection. It's personal. It's authentic. It's an experiential uh, love of God that is in us. It's so deep that it can't do anything but it overflow into our affection to Him. Have you said this this week? I love you, God. Most of us don't even tell our spouses that in a week. <laughs> Have you said it to your God? Have you said, I love you for saving my soul? I love you for protecting me all from these years. I love you because you have blessed me beyond measure. I love you because you've given me children. I love you because you have been so much the, the Savior to my soul. Have you shed tears over that love? It's so genuine. So deep. And it's springing up. It's coming. You feel it? You know what I'm talking about? Do you feel that in you? Is that there? So what difference does this make for me? <laughs> Well, the truth is we should enjoy emotionally the fatherhood of God. It's, do you know what? There's a mind, will, and what? What's the third one? In the soul. Mind, will, and what? Yeah. You've seen my chart, haven't you? Mind, will, and emotion. That's right. That's what makes up the soul. And you know that when you go to a psychiatrist, they try to deal and tinker with mind, will, and emotion. And they try to wrap those back and piece them back together so that you can be something whole. Because to them, that's the core of who you are. My friend, there is one more component, and it is the spiritual. And until the spiritual gets settled that God is real and His love is shed abroad, you'll never be able to piece all that back uh, piece together exactly the way God intended it to be. And that's kind of a side note. But anyway, from the it's okay for us to emotionally enjoy God. You know, when somebody says, oh, it's nothing but emotion. Well, I'm sorry. When I got saved, all of me got saved. Mine will and what? Come on. Sure. You know, sometimes I weep. Sometimes I'm so happy that I just break out into a a happy dance. Anybody got a happy dance? Everybody, when you're watching a ball game, you got a happy dance. When they score, yes! <laughs> you know, it's, oh! But then when it comes to God, everybody's like, I don't think I'm going to have any happy time with God. He's going to make me so good I won't be able to have fun. What the hey, man? What is going on there? See, they've lost the sense of the freedom and the and what we've been saved from, the bondage of sin. We've been saved from death. We have been brought into life. The love of God shed abroad in who you are. You now can enjoy living like never before. There ought to be a Happy dance like crazy. The testimony of the Spirit is not a, some kind of premise, if you will, that we can deduce that we are children of God. Let me tell you something. We are children of God by the power of God which delights in shedding abroad in us who He is. I am a child of God. How do you can tell me I'm not all you want? I'm go. Uh, yeah, I think I know I am. What are you talking about? I know I am. Tell go ahead. Tell me I'm not. I don't care, huh? Because I know what's in me. I know what God has done in me, and nobody can negate that. See, your personal testimony in Christ, there's no one that can come against it. Why? Because you're the one that's lived it. 
Now, you might sit and have a debate about uh, this, that, and the other, but there is no debate about what God has done in me. So what am I saying today? I'm saying, look to Jesus. <laughs> look to Christ. If you want to know that you're a child of God, listen. Are you listening? Do you want to know if you're a child of God? But Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. Listen. You want to know if you're a child of God? Listen. Listen to the gospel. Just read the Bible, and if all of a sudden it leaps off the page and begins to leap into your spirit, my friend, God is speaking to you. Listen. So if you want to know you're a child of God, listen to the gospel and look to the cross. Christ paid the price for sin. He paid for my redemption. He has done everything that needs to be done. All I need to do is recognize that is the way, the truth, and the life, and I receive Him. And then pray that the Holy Spirit would enable me to see what is really real in Him and what is of this world. He says, be in the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not... What does that mean? Uh oh But God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The testimony of the Spirit is that when we look at the cross, we cry, Jesus, You are my Lord. So I call you to look to Christ today. Look to Jesus and accept Him and embrace Him today and become a child of God.